thank you for for joining in this 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 session. I'm I'm going to tackle um, the second part of this community section uh, session. Um, my colleague Melba uh, will be or will have already presented her 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 part, focusing more on Africa, and I'm going to look at Latin America, which has its own peculiar own particularities and um, own realities that that make it quite unique when it comes to communities and uh, conflicts in particular. Um, Right from the beginning, I, I'd just like to state that uh, um, that I'm, you know, I'm probably going to avoid just giving a very prescriptive um, presentation about what, you know, many of you perhaps are coming here for looking for recommendations and solutions for for, for getting for doing good community relations and engagement. But um, I'm going to try and stay away from that because I think we, I think one of the the big issues with this topic is is that we don't really understand the nuances around the the conflicts. And I'd also like to say say that um, you know, doing community relations or community issues in 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 you know in a in energy transitions is is not really um, so different to, to 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 doing the to doing community work, you know, before the, the transitions, uh, before energy transitions. It's it, the main difference is the intensity and the amount of mining that's going to take place. So that's the main. Thing to bear in mind but having said that i think there is there's a lot of merit to, to talk about the peculiarity about the particularities of um of of energy transitions and how that's going to impact um community relations and community conflicts i just quickly wanted to show this um this slide from the world bank uh, out last year just it's just uh, um affirming what you already know i'm sure what you've heard from other presenters about the um the huge increase in demand that we're going to require off certain minerals. So there are certain minerals, and um, although it's not the focus of my presentation, but um, you know, minerals such as uh, graphite, lithium, cobalt, um, copper, especially it's not mentioned here, and, and um, nickel as well, I, from what I understand, for electric vehicles and, and other, you know, it, the, the wind energy parks as, as, as well. So, you know, we're going to require a whole lot more digging of the ground and extracting of these minerals and Latin America, especially the triangle between northern Chile, Bolivia and Argentina has a lot of these minerals, speaking, you know, in, in particular lithium and, and, and between Chile and, and Peru is a lot of the copper deposits of the world. So uh, we're really going to be relying a lot on on those uh, in, the, in the coming years and, and the communities will certainly be feeling it. They, they already are. Um, this this just came out. I thought I would share it last year as well in in the prestigious Nature Communications Journal. Um, just just reminding us that renewing renewable energy production it's really going to intensify um, you know the mining threats towards biodiversity and and often um, communities could be indigenous communities could be um, defending bi their biodiversity their own nature. Um, often indigenous communities, um, worldviews or cosmovisions are intertwined um, completely with ecology, with nature, and there's no separation uh, made there, uh, unlike in more Western and modern society. So um, you can imagine already that some of the conflicts of this will um, perhaps trigger. Um, some of you might be aware of, of this um, of this organization, uh, Environmental Justice Atlas, which is out of a um, university in Barcelona, who map uh, different environmental conflicts, um, environmental justice conflicts. And I just, a few days ago, I, I went into, into their website. If you're interested, you can find it too quite easily. Um, and I did a search for uh, mining related conflicts. And, and as you can see, there's 653 at the moment. And you can see Latin America, especially the western half of it, where the Andes Mountains are, and also across Central America is very much uh, populated with orange dots. So um, each one of those represents um, an ongoing uh, conflict. And, and worryingly so, you can see more and more appearing in the, in the Amazon region too, which is where the new frontier for copper mining seems to be heading. Um, so I also wanted to share with you, um, I found a very useful uh, resource here with an organization I'm very familiar with called the Business and Human Rights Resource Center. Um, they've created their own transition minerals tracker. So that's very relevant, of course, to this talk and, and to this whole series. 
and I think it's interesting it's, it's, it, to, to note that most of the, um, of the conflicts that they have uncovered are related directly to communities um, and, and especially when communities are protesting. Um, and so what, they, what they're advocating for is that, you know, consultation and consent from communities is really vital, um, you know, when doing renewable energy mining projects. Um, you know, what one in eight of the the abuses they recorded in transition minerals features a community protesting. So um, it's really important to for, for, for mining companies and, and governments to really respect the right to protest, and also when it comes to indigenous peoples, to respect their right to to give consent uh, and follow, you know, international law such as the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the ILO 169. Um, uh, legislation. Um, continuing on with the website from the Business uh, and Human Rights Resource Centre and their, and their tracker of transition minerals, they have an interesting way of looking at different minerals. So I took nickel here and, and they look at the top five companies that actually produce nickel around the world. And um, I mean, some of these were appearing also in, in other minerals too. Um, you, 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 I saw Anglo-American appear a few times, BHP Billiton, which is now the most valued uh, company in the London Stock Exchange due to the ex, ex, you know increasing demand in, in, in for their for minerals Glencore as well um, you see a Russian company there and Vale from Brazil um, and, and what you can see there is that you know most of them have well, actually all of them have a human rights policy which is probably the easiest and low, lowest hanging fruit to to really work on on these issues um, to create a policy and, and also maybe to join uh, membership of an organization such as ICMM, ICMM uh, which any of you in, in mining will be familiar with. And they, they offer a lot of guidance uh, around how to do good community relations and how to respect community rights. Um, and also whether they're a member of the voluntary principles on, on security and human rights. But you can also see that the Valley, for example, and Glencore uh, have also allegations uh, made against them for human rights abuse. So by having a policy, and I can also tell you that I've, I've actually been to uh, Anglo-Americans operations uh, at least some years ago, and, and there were a lot of complaints back then. Uh, I'm not sure how it is these days, but um, so, you know, having a complaint, uh, sorry, having a, a human rights policy doesn't guarantee you that um, you'll, you'll then get it right. It's really important to implement this, this policy. And I think that's the theme I really want going through my uh, my presentation uh, today is if you really want to get it right and, and do well in terms of community engagement, um, you know, uh, throughout the, the energy transition, um, you know, and mining for the, for the energy transition, it's really important to pay attention to human rights and business. And this, this subfield has really emerged in the last decade with plenty of publications and guidance and consultants and a whole industry out there to, to give you to give you great um, um, orientation around this, and and I'm sure if you're listening from a large uh, mining corporation, you'll 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 be well on your journey already and, and quite familiar with these terms. And and I just mentioned the human rights, um, the the UN principles on business and human rights. So if you're not familiar with them, I would try to get familiar with that document. You can see there, uh, it, it's it's a very you know easy to read. Um, a document which provides um, multiple principles about how you can go about, especially pillar two. It's, it's done in with three pillars, and, and pillar two is about the corporate responsibility to respect human rights. And I think you can go through that as a company, or if, if you're working for a company as a consultant, you know, um, and and sort of do your own self-assessment and see what well, are we, how much due diligence are we really doing when it comes to human rights. Um, and then pillar three is, is just as important. It's about when things don't go right, which is bound to happen in a mega project. You know, you're bound to have a complaint because of dust or vehicles or some sort of maybe other health allegations or water related um, issues. And, and, and pillar three is about access to justice or um, remedy. And it's really important to have uh, the right um, systems in place for, for, for dealing with grievances. Uh, and then on the, on the left hand side, you know, I, I thought I, I would show the example of an Anglo-American's um, toolbox uh, for, do, for dealing with um, communities. It's been around for a while, 
for some years, but I think it's it's a very detailed one. I I, I don't work for Anglo American or anything, but um, I think it's you know if if you're in a smaller junior mining company, um, you can get good um inspiration. I think um from from that toolbox um, and you know we mentioned ICMM and, and you can also go to their websites for example they they have from some years ago a, a, a community uh, relations toolkit um, over there where, where they talk about the importance of um, you know how to really understand the nature of your it's really important to understand the nature of your relationship um, understand how you influence communities as well and you know I, I don't want to spend my um, time just just going into giving you a um, very descriptive and prescriptive one you know one to ten point you know do this don't do that um, I think you know you can um, find out that information yourself very easily and then also if you're if you're if you're in a project with indigenous people as well ICMM also have their um, good practice guide for indigenous peoples and, and ICMM uh, have recently committed to following international law when it comes to indigenous peoples and that means um, ILO 169 and, and you know where indigenous peoples must give their consent and, and um, not doing mining where indigenous peoples do not consent to having um, a mining project on their land. Um, I really wanted to um, mention this you know, to, to bring this to to, to raise this um, following uh, communication um, with you and I think it, it, for me it represents a real uh, turning point and it's also from the business and human rights um, resource centers website because their, their main uh, objective really and their, their main uh, raison d'etre is, is, is really been to accept um, complaints about companies and uh, um, with regards to human rights and just and then go to the company and ask the company would well, you want to give a response to this if the company does so then then the resource center will publish the the allegation and the response and I think it's been a very you know without making any judge judgment on that it's been a very effective uh, methodology that they followed and and this came out um, uh, just just recently um, the date's not there but it was this year and maybe in maybe last month. Um, you know, I've, I've been working in, in um, the area of um, um, mining and, and community conflicts in Latin America for about 12, 13 years now. And, and um, you know, when I was finishing off my PhD on this topic about uh, eight years ago, I never thought I would, we would get to this stage where a company would be so forthcoming um, about saying, and, and explicit saying that, look, if a community does not consent uh, or if a community actually opposes us and I've, I've highlighted here you know Anglo-American also respects the rights of indigenous communities to, to oppose mining related activities on their land and will refrain from undertaking any activities if consent is, with, with, is withheld. Um, at least I just wanted to, to emphasize that um, for me it's, it's almost like revolutionary to, to see um, um, a large mining corporation you know go to this length um, because you know, if if I had perhaps suggested something like this to a mining company five or ten years ago, um, it wouldn't have been such a welcome reception, I think. Um, but it just goes to show how how far the needle has moved in terms of uh, perhaps activism or or with internal co company thinking and 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 you know changing on strategies about how to do this. But so I think it's important for you, um, whoever you are and whatever you're working on, when it comes to communities that. Um, you know, we've now got to a stage where we really have to respect that um, that sentiment from communities about um, opposing, about saying no. And then this is going to be a huge conundrum, of course, because if we need, we think about the World Bank slide, that we need all these minerals, uh, yet there are more and more communities who are saying no. Well, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a huge underlying tension there um, to be dealt with um, that needs addressing. And um, I'll speak a bit of a, a bit about that at the very end about pos potential solutions there but this this uh, whole case that i'm showing right now is related to doing my the idea of mining in the in the amazon and i think also any any large or, or any actually any mining company should should have as explicit policy or position stance on on what it wants about what it uh, about its own position regarding the amazon and does it really want to go into the amazon and mine uh, for for copper or, or whatever may be the, the the transition mineral there um so i mean yeah moving coming towards the end of 
with my presentation. Um, I think, you know, as I, as I said a few times, rather than me just um, giving a prescriptive uh, one, you know, one to 10 point list about what to do to get mm -hmm. to have good community relations, which I don't think really works in practice because local contexts are so complex. There's so much complexity going on there and um, well-meaning, um, you know, well-meaning, um, high-reaching, you know, um, policies and guidance around human rights or around community relations and sustainability uh, just don't seem to be able to reach and, and reach those local complexities. So I think rather than go into just some prescription um, right now and, you know, we can maybe discuss that in, 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 in the in the dialogue, in the question and answer session. But uh, I thought it would be useful for us to actually ask questions. I think it's, it's, it's really a moment to ask questions. And these questions, I, I sort of um, arrived at them and, and you know, they, they I sort of thought about them whilst also bearing in mind the fact that, you know, why do we have so many conflicts if now we now have a couple of decades of companies working uh, and implementing um, so many um, CSR and, and, and sustainability related and social license to operated related policies. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a bit of a mismatch going on, you know, companies are doing increasingly more on, on the subject and the conflicts are increasingly rising. One, one, one uh, response I, 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 norm I normally hear is, well, it's because there's a lot more technology today. Anybody has, everybody's got access to a mobile phone that can record and they can write to um, uh, NGOs and tell them that this, and this wasn't possible back in the 80s or 90s so easily. But I think it is more nuanced than that. So I think we should ask ourselves, um, how exactly is consent secured and obtained? Um, it's, it's, it's a really important question. It's a question that perhaps some uh, critical uh, NGOs or scholars would be asking, but I think companies really need to think about it too uh, for their own good. Um, what about the voices of human rights defenders during consent processes? We all we all know that that communities are often divided and fragmented about when you know when going through a consenting and consultation process. You know, some of us, some people in the community have the right to say yes. We you know we want to. We want this. We see a clear benefit. We believe mitigation and compensation will work, and we'll get to a good win-win solution. But others will just say, "No, this is completely against our um, against our identity as, as a people, and it's it's just not compatible in the slightest." So, you know, what happens to the, to their voices um, if if a project is is licensed? Because you know, quite often states will will sort of um, state agencies seem, at least in Latin America, to side more with um, moving the project ahead. And actually moving beyond human rights, you know, we should ask ourselves what impacts has uh, the campaign to secure, a, you know, consent and a social license have had on a, on a pre-existing community cohesion? You know, has it actually contributed to, to dividing it more? Um, often I hear that, no, the community has been divided for many years and there's been problems. Uh, we, we, you know, we may be adding just a small um, grain of salt to it. But um, it's really worth asking those questions as well. If you're wanting to avoid conflict uh, and if you're wanting to really respect human rights, what policies around ethical conduct do you have for, for workers? And I don't just mean direct workers, but um, outsourced and contractors, uh, which is very common in big operations and also suppliers, especially during the, those periods that are very tense of around environmental and social licensing. You know, what, what stories I normally hear about are, you know, in those periods where licenses are sought and, and licensing is going on and all, you've got public hearings, etc. Mining companies and some of the ones mentioned in, you know, the top five ones that I mentioned earlier on will sort of encourage their workers to go in there with the uniforms to the meetings and show a real sign of, uh, of, of uh, unity there to, to really kind of almost influence, almost like if it was a football game, having the fans there to, to sort of cheer on the team. And, you know, it what are the ethics around that is and how do you feel what well, what is your position on that as a company um uh you know all, all is fair in, in in love and war they as, as well you could take that position too um what you know what should you do in territories um where that have actually declared autonomy and this is an increasing phenomenon in latin america um i'm thinking of the example of a community that i went to visit 
in um, on the border between Peru and Ecuador, but in in, board, in in Peru, very isolated community, far from you know you've got to take a a, a plane and a very long road journey, then two different boat journeys, a few days to get there. But the community of, of the the One Piece people have declared autonomy um, as a, as their own net sovereign nation, and it was it's done. The main objective there is is to base to be to basically be able to reject and veto any extractive projects and, and that's what they've been doing and they've been saying look we've now got to the stage where if you even want to come in and have a consultation with us about an extractive project we're not going to entertain that we're not going to even you know if you want to talk about something else that's fine so you know what is what is your position um, when it comes to these sorts of communities that are increasingly grow you know and um, sprouting out more across the continent and Actually, another phenomenon which I see happening even more, almost on a monthly basis, um, is the referendums. Is a is, is you know is a local mayor, and you see this happening a lot across Colombia and Peru, especially. Even um, I've seen it happen in Chile too. Around, do you want the mine or not? And more often than not, it's 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 a clear win uh, for the for the, those who oppose the mine. And and there are a lot of questions asked about how democratic and the process of, of that voting. Uh, it's not often um, recognised by the by the state government, but these are signs and signals of, of um, important signs of um, of how much community support you have. And I think you know you need to have a position about what you're going to do in in those situations. And you know maybe some of you who are from companies have already faced those those um, situations. So um, I think this is my yeah my final two slides. Um, Clean energy transition uh, is, is really going to lead to a soaring demand to extract, um, you know, copper, nickel, cobalt and, and, and lithium. You already know that, I guess. Latin America is home to most of the social environmental justice conflicts, especially communities who are opposing mining and, and not, so in, not so much interested in negotiating better deals and better benefits. But just a lot of them just want to say no. And that's I think, is very particular to Latin America more so than Africa or, or, or even Asia. Um, so you really need to, I think my main piece of advice is treat treat each community as different. So I know you, as a corporation, especially, it's very easy to just have one blanket policy and, and, you know, which can have a lot of nuance in it. But really remember that local context is king. Um, you know, really paying attention to that local context is, is by far more important than just going in with a with a with a blanket, you know, a blanket um, sort of policy on sustainability. Um, which has very good intentions and meanings. Um, you know, try to have different policies in place about how to address mining um, where local where local opposition is significant. You know, even where it's sort of 30, 40 percent, you know, that, that can sometimes create big, big social problems and, and with local cohesion too. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned earlier, try to work with a human rights mindset. And so the UN guiding principles have been, um, you know, there's consensus around them between business, between states and between civil society. Um, so, you know, there's no need to reinvent the wheel there. So, you know, really work to work in line with those. Um, but, you know, but make sure you do so throughout the whole organization. Of course, often the engineers, their their bonuses are tied to production um, um, targets and, and, and so forth. So, you know, really try to make sure that, that the company is working towards um, the respect of human rights. You know, I'm not saying you should turn into like an NGO or a human rights NGO yourself. You know, your, your job is to mine minerals out of the ground as well. But um, you know, work work with that respect uh, at the at the front of your um, um, priorities. Make it a priority, despite how contrarian this may feel. Um, times are truly changing, and I'm thinking about the slide I had about Anglo Americans communication. And about all these different referendums and, and declarations of autonomy, you know, if if not, you may risk uh, human and ecological harms as well as serious reputational crises. And here I'm thinking of Rio Tinto. I'm sure all of you um, are familiar with their case of um, um, the the Yukon George. I think uh, is the name of the case in Australia. You know, I, I'm I've been lecturing about these topics for some years now, and and back in 2015, I would often use um, Rio Tinto's human rights policy. I wouldn't put Rio Tinto's name on it and ask students, where do you think this is coming from? And, and always the, the answer was uh, some kind of NGO, like Amnesty or someone like that. And I'd say, no, it's a mining company, Rio Tinto. And so 
it was the most um, progressive, or it is the most progressive uh, human rights policy. However, what we saw happening a couple of months ago shows just how precarious human rights policies can be when leaders or you know when companies are really um, dead set on, on on going against human rights and their own policy. So it's um, I, I really hope um, companies will have will have learned from that. And um, I, I want to keep this uh, as short as possible for time purposes. But this is a bit of more of a radical. Um, um, thinking out aloud uh, slide about you know how can we really maybe even going beyond community relations and actually um, you know in order to minimize conflicts and I think we really have got to a stage where uh, we need to think about developing new technologies uh, to minimize use and, and, and waste of, of, of water which I think companies are already doing but more so than that we've already mined a lot already you know I don't know how many millions of tons of minerals and they've been used and they've been thrown into waste. And I'm sure that mining companies have the know-how or can create that know-how um, and, and uh, intelligence and with all the capacities they've got, human intelligence, about mining from waste. You know, I'm sure you can get a lot of them. Um, and, and, uh, and I'm sure I'm not the first person to, to suggest this either. And the other initiatives must be already ongoing. But with the amount of waste we generate, um, I wonder if mining companies can dedicate more, you know, an increasing amounts of their resources to just getting this, getting getting their minerals from from waste, and they're therefore not having to go to communities uh, that are already kind of saturated from mining in in certain areas. So, uh, with that food for thought, I will um, end my presentation. Hello everyone, my name is Mel Bawasuna, I'm the External Affairs Manager at Base Titanium and today I will be giving a presentation on mineral extraction and communities, particularly looking at the African context um, and I will be doing this um, as follows. I'll give a brief introduction of the mineral sector in Africa and then we will look at social justice and sustainability issues. In particular, throughout the whole presentation, we'll look at the notion of a social license to operate, what this means, how does it play out um, in real-time context, and how, what are the best practices around it, what are the issues of governance and regulation um, around it. So as we begin, mining is one of Africa's most important industries. Africa hosts about 30% of the Earth's mineral reserves and mining of our minerals is or plays a huge contribution towards local employment, foreign exchange earnings and national GDPs. Now, anywhere in the world, not just in Africa, mining tends to be associated with positive impacts on human rights, you know, the right to work, it provides jobs. Those jobs then tend to alleviate the social economic uh, circumstances of employees. And by extension, then those employees are able to take their children to school, so right to education, um, right to housing, because they're able to afford to live um, um, well. And what's usually talked about is the negative impacts that mining has on human rights. Because mining has had devastating impacts on human health systems and social structures, our production systems, cultural traditions, physical displacement and the like. To such an extent that mining has come to be associated with the so-called research uh, resource curse. Now, this is simply put, mining is meant to alleviate socioeconomic um, st uh, burdens that we face. But in Africa, mining has been associated with the opposite of this, which is increased corruption, income inequality, civil unrest and environmental damage, to mention but a few. So how do we propel the issue of acceptance of mining as a legitimate sector, not just as a sector that is here to harm people and to make others rich uh, at the expense of the majority. And the issue comes down to social license to operate. 
This notion of a social license to operate has particularly taken hold in the last five or so years. And it's, the definition is not quite uh, firmed up, um, but the social mining to operate, um, the social license to operate a mine has certainly become the cornerstone of many discussions. It's no longer enough for investors, multinational companies, to get mineral licenses or permits or um, execute uh, mining agreements with the governments, but they have to have, the projects have to have acceptability by the communities. Otherwise, as I will show later, you will find that communities will start protesting against mining projects. They will feel they're not a part of it. And so even if the projects stop, in fact, more often than not, they will go for that option, right? Simply put, the social license to operate refers to community acceptance of mining at the very basic of it. Has the community that you're going to mine in accepted the project? Largely, in the last 10 years, 10, 15 years, I should say, the way social license to operate uh, started manifesting itself was through corporate social responsibility. Whereas companies will do various projects for the communities, whether it's building a school, healthcare, some social infrastructure, boreholes, you name it. And for a while there, it worked because it was the first showing that companies do care about the communities. But the notion has since evolved, as I will show later on. Failing to obtain a social uh, license to operate, this again is in addition to the government license to operate or the legal license to operate, can have very dire consequences for both companies and um, governments. And this is, this we've seen this in a variety of countries. So Kenya, for the last nine years now, a call, a 3.5 billion call, uh, 3.5 um, billion dollar caller project has been unable to take off because of community resistance. Uganda, uh, oil production did not take off for almost 15 years simply because the community had conflicts with the investors. That was leading to lots and lots of um, demonstrations. Tanzania, same thing. In fact, in Tanzania, the issues went so deep that there was loss of life, extensive infrastructural damage. You've got South Africa, Ghana, Zimbabwe, where protests, social discord, social unrest um, surround different mining projects because they fail to obtain a social license to operate. So how do we, we, we need to understand what are the tensions what are the parameters? What are the, what, what are the things that enable investors to obtain this social license to operate? Perhaps a better way would be what not to do. Um, we might want to look at it that way, but we've, I've, I've termed it in, in the following themes, right? There's demand for rights. More often than not, whenever a mining project comes to town, it's usually in a very marginalized area, where the community have got a special attachment to land, cultural attachment to land. And so automatically there's resistance because you're asking people to move away from an area that they have lived for hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years. Um, and all their, their sense of being tends to be tied to the land. And this is when companies need to be very conscious when you're going to these areas, what are you walking into? Because that will help you, um, that will help them, should I say, get a sense of how do you even begin to engage these communities? Because for instance, if you're dealing with pastoralist communities, the notion of having community engagement meetings between nine and five quickly falls away. A lot of these pastoralist communities during certain periods of the day are out there looking for water for their animals. So what does that mean for the company when it comes to conducting meaningful stakeholder engagement? Issues of water access and quality will arise. Often there is lack of infrastructure in these regions and the communities are reliant on one um, water body and we know mining requires a lot of water. What does this mean? 
Okay, communities more and more demanding a clean and safe environment. So when they hear that mining comes on board and there's going to be quite a disturbance, should it, should it be through noise, pollution, through dust and the like, or through uh, their waterways are going to be uh, polluted, there's a lot of angst in the air. So you'll find communities asking for social license to operate or demanding that their certain rights are protected, that they have a right to clean and safe environment for them to be able to engage with this company, that there's respect of their culture and their heritage, that issues of resettlement and compensation are looked at and dealt with fairly. There's also a different way that communities um, enforce this social license to operate through the notion of procedural fairness. Oftentimes, when mining companies uh, approach these communities, there's almost a formality to it. You know, they'll come in with a sign-in sheet, put in your names, and sign here that you attended. But more often than not, that's not enough. You will find communities complaining that there's information asymmetry. What the company has is not what they have as information, so they always feel something has been hidden from them, and they tend to start questioning um, the motives. They feel that they have a right to have free, prior, and informed consent, FPIC, which has been affirmed by the African Commission on Human Rights as a human right. Um, they also feel that community engagement is not necessarily tailor-made to suit their particular circumstances, that companies and sometimes governments come with a particular approach that is unwilling to be, to be shifted to uh, take into account their own cultural affiliations and the like. Um, so procedural rights are important, problems of um, public participation, access to information, access to justice. And finally, the other way that communities enforce social license to operate is by the demand for services. In the last, should I say, maybe 10 years, we've heard more and more of the notion of local content. And this is something that communities are more aware of. They're demanding to be part of the supply chain. Um, they are want to be trained so that they can be able to take advantage of the business opportunities that come uh, with the mining project. They are looking for employment for their people at all cadastres of the mining company, not just the extremely low level ones. They are asking um, for a variety for a variety of things. And so these services that community are asking for, including infrastructure, social infrastructure development, um, or just social services, education and health, are part of the way in which communities negotiate directly with their companies um, on, the so on their social license to operate. So how has Africa responded? In the last few years in particular, um, I, will, I should mention that when CSR was first introduced, a lot of companies started doing all these good things for the community, putting up schools, putting up health centers. But down the road, um, a trace of bitterness started emerging from communities because one, they felt these are top down being imposed on them uh, from the company to them. They don't really have a hand in um, how they'll be implemented, where they should go. Um, they, they have for how long they will last. So, when we look at all those things and then when we look back at where are the gaps in the regulatory systems, you find that there was weak governance framework, both in the regulatory and institutional capacities, lack of transparency and accountability, capacity challenges, lack of political will, corruption, okay? All this contribute to governance gaps. And more and more, the solution that has emerged quite organically, I might add, um, is legislating the social license to, to operate. Having this notion embedded in legislation is now in the last five years or so, what is happening in Africa, whereby they're saying that we need a means to hold companies and governments accountable for these projects that they're implementing with the community directly as communities. So you will find that most CSR projects are now being um, mandated through community development agreements, through um, provisions for sharing of royalties uh, with communities, community trust funds, local content provisions, and the like. I'll give you a few examples. In my home country, Kenya, the Mining Act of 2016 um, 
has mandated that each investor needs to conclude a community development agreement with the local community in which it operates. And this has given the communities the, to be at the forefront of implementation of any community projects. It's no longer the investor to dictate or to say, they can suggest, um, but really it's the community that is taking charge of the, of the implementation of the projects. They are the ones who go out, listen to the communities, uh, come back as a committee and engage with the company, set out their priorities, together develop a budget and implementation schedule. And we are finding this is gaining more and more acceptance. And therefore the social license to operate is kept fluid, you know, it's kept malleable. Should issues arise, there's a structure and a legal one too that uh, can be used to resolve the issues. Okay? The Community Development Agreement is a legally binding agreement. Tanzania too amended its law in 2019 to specifically provide for CSR uh, and social assets to operate in these legislations, Guinea, Mali, uh, Mozambique, Nigeria, Zambia, South Africa, Sierra Leone as well have all passed legislations or amended prevailing legislations to cater for social license to operate. So let's look at a few or two case studies. For the longest time, like I've said, um, companies were adhering to the CSR narrative. Based at Kenya, um, came into Kenya in 2010 and began exports uh, in 2014. It's Kenya's largest uh, mining project in the south coast uh, of the country. And it represents 65% of Kenya's total mineral output value. At the very beginning, CSR was very dominant in its processes. Um, and also it was what the community had demanded. The community wanted a social hall, they wanted balls, dark, they wanted a health center. And these were done by 2013-2014 and the question is what else? So a holistic approach to social assets to operators was developed. Okay. Community engagement became a very deliberate process. The mechanism used was to create committees that would interface between base titanium and the communities. Okay. The communities, the committees, the liaison committees were composed by elected community officials. So there had to be elections and the community all had to agree that yes, this is our, our these are our reps and those are the ones who will be liaising with base titanium on our behalf. And through those community liaison um, committees, they developed four ways of engaging the communities. Community infrastructure, they put together health centers, dispensaries, a blood bank, medical surgery facilities, all of these were not present before base titania. People had to travel maybe about 60, 80 kilometers to the nearest health facility. Base built and refurbished schools in Kuala, where it's at the county where it's operating from. So those are within the lines of a more traditional CSR. But it went, base went a step further. It developed livelihood programs in 2015, 2016. And this really, the idea was what happens when the mine closes? How does the community support itself, even if the, mine, the, mine, the, the life of the mine has come to an end? So they basically got together a group of agricultural experts, uh, conducted extensive tests on the soils, and the soil around the mine site and beyond were found to support uh, cotton, sorghum, potato farming, None of these agricultural projects had been undertaken in this particular area before. And so they went further, base went further, and worked with uh, partners, NGOs, um, to look for markets um, for these communities. And you can imagine from a community that was literally earning $2 a day to where they're getting, they're now getting because of a successful cotton growing program about $1,000 a month, the difference it has made in the lives of people. And the best thing is, these programs will still be there way after the miners closed. Okay. The third pillar they looked at was community health. Um, they put up health units. They have trained um, hundreds of community health volunteers. Okay. They've got very extensive community health programs. And finally, education. 
the community was very much underserved uh, in terms of uh, education. Their literacy rates are quite low. Uh, Bates Titanium started this um, scholarships program and it took off. So today, Bates Titanium has over 2,000 scholarships, both from primary, secondary, all the way to tertiary education. Bates Titanium then looked at how are we leaving? with our community, what does the environment look like? How are we incorporating the, the community to be able to take care of the environment? So the community members are the ones that are growing the seedlings for the grass that will be used for the rehabilitation. And other than growing the seedlings that we buy from them, they then come and plant the grass themselves that are going some training. The whole purpose of this is to show that the social assets to operate cannot be one way or you know, very straight path. You have to look at the community, where you are, what are their needs, what are what are their interests, how do they wish to grow, and then develop a multifaceted way of responding to various groups in the community because a community is also not homogeneous, right? There are various factions of community. You have to work with women leaders. You have to work with elders. You have to work with those who have gone to school all day to tertiary education and those whose education basically stopped at primary school. So finding a way that you are able to reach and impact um, the community within their diversity is the best way to keep your social license to operate because the social license to operate is not a static thing. It's dynamic, it can change period to period, almost on a daily basis, depending on who you're dealing with on the ground. And the idea is to keep your finger on the pulse. I'll quickly go through the case, uh, second case study. Um, Kenya struck oil uh, through Talo Oil in 2012. They made the first commercial discovery. And almost from the outset, uh, Talo was very clear that its sustainability strategy had three prongs. They wanted to optimize local content and develop supply, supplier capacity. They wanted to build the local skills of the people. And they wanted to work on social infrastructure projects such as water, because Chukana is a very dry area in the northern part of Kenya. Almost from the very beginning, the company experienced a series of protests. So they started in 20, the weeks, uh, struck oil in 2012. 2013, the protest starts. 2,000 res residents out in the streets. What was the issue? Jobs and tenders, they were not being given. 2014, another protest. Uh, once again, the communities out in the streets. Issue, uh, they were comparing the wages and they saw that they were not being paid wages that on a par as to their other counterparts from other parts of Nairobi or um, uh, internationals. 2015, a four-day roadblock. Um, November 2016, um, again, another roadblock. 2018, local protests that came in two forms, one after the other. Okay, And this project, when you follow up with the community, they will explain to you that, one, they felt that they were excluded from major decisions that Talo was making. They were not in the know. They did not get information directly from Talo. Or the people that Talo used as spokespeople were not necessarily accepted by the communities. And they felt that there was lack of a comprehensive stakeholder engagement framework. Okay, So access to, issue, to, info, to, access to information became an issue, which then led uh, to questions of lack of transparency. There was also accusations of unfulfilled promises. They said they'll put a ball here, but they ended up putting a neighboring community. You know, so not being sensitive to those local dynamics. Also managing community expectations. Once the oil was struck, everybody assumed that they'll be driving a limousine in a year and have several wives and the homesteads will just, you know, change. Um, but oil um, extraction, you know, it takes it takes years. Uh, infrastructure, if it's lacking, also takes years to be built. And that lack of managing people's expectations led to people feeling disappointed um, and then questioning the goodwill of the company. Um, the grievance management mechanism they felt was underdeveloped. It was very corporate-centered. Um, there were also tensions about land acquisition and compensation. They felt that a uh, compensation framework was imposed on them. There was no community input, or if it was there, it was just rudimentary and the like. So the most important lessons from this um, 
case studies I can say is social license to operate is absolutely critical to the government license to operate or the legal license to operate. Only one needs to remember that it's dynamic and it needs to be watered. It needs to be worked on every day for it to maintain its elasticity um, and for it to endure. Thank you very much and I look forward to engaging with you.